Hello, everyone. Welcome to an episode of Exploring the Arts Around Us. I'm Monica Merrill, your host. To me, art is anything that is created with skill and talent, something that is beautiful, something that inspires, something that makes me feel. Uh, through these series, I've been exploring different forms of art. And today, we're going to talk about something that's very interesting to me, and that is color. A few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, I met the women from the Washington Spinners and Weavers Guild. Um, we're seated, seated here in their meeting room at Center Presbyterian Church. They let us drop in to do a segment about color and fiber and fiber art dyeing. Um, you know, all of us experience color. When you're getting ready to buy something to wear or something to put in your home, you're always looking at color. That's usually the determining factor. Everything we buy today almost is made from think materials that are colored through a commercial manufactured process. Not these ladies. These ladies do it like it used to be done. So today we're going to have a very interesting demonstration of fiber and fabric color dyeing with women from the Washington Spinners and Weavers Guild. So we're going to take a minute, we're going to bring the ladies in, show you how they do it, what they use, and hopefully it'll be something that gets you excited about the possibility. Thanks. We'll be back in one second. So we're going to do some fiber and fiber art, fiber craft dyeing today. I want to introduce first Barb Campbell, who is the 2B president and chair, incoming, incoming, incoming president. president of the Washington Spinners and Weavers Guild. Barb's the one I've been talking to about the program. She's the one I met. You may have seen her when they were at the library. She was doing weaving. And at some point in the future, we're going to coerce her maybe into doing a program. But I wanted to make sure I introduce Barb. The Guild has been in existence since 1975 and mm -hmm. is still going strong. So as I said, they're always open to new members. So before we have any more conversation about that, let's talk about the fact that the process we're going to show you is not a spur of the moment thing. These ladies have been working for weeks, maybe months, preparing things to dye, sources of dye, and things along those lines to get to this point we are today. So I'm going to switch over and introduce you to Deb Hadfield, who is going to be our primary dye consultant. Deb. You've collected all these things plus things outside. Let's yes. talk a little bit first of all okay. about the preparation. All righty. So it, again, it's not like you didn't wake up this morning and decide to do it, did you? No, this has been uh, in uh, my mind for quite a while. And unfortunately with the uh, lack of rain, um, I had to buy some of the flowers today <laughs> uh, because my flowers are all depleted and uh, so were everybody else's. So. Um, so talk about the sources. Uh, uh, in the beginning, um, dyes were often just made from plants. Correct. But as time went on, they've incorporated other things. So talk about some of the plants and some of the things you use. Okay, this is, um, uh, what is this? Coriopsis? Cor Coriopsis. Um, these are um, from our beech nut tree in our yard. This is from Tansy. And uh, can I show the other yarn? Sure. Um, One of the things that's interesting is the colors that you get aren't necessarily the colors that are demonstrated in the particular item. Right. Um, I used uh, tansy uh, on this skeins of yarn, and it comes from the tansy um, flowers, and they're just small little flowers, um, no bigger than that, uh, but these are not tansy. These are um, feverfew, I believe. Um, and this is from Stinging Nettle. Uh, I did not collect any of that today because that's, uh, they cut it all down where my source was. Um, this lady stops on the side of the road for things. So I do. You can imagine. And uh, this is mint, um, some spearmint that was in the yard. Um, these are ferns that were outside. Uh, these are good for dyeing. Uh, two different kinds of uh, eucalyptus. Um, uh, goldenrod, which is uh, a great color this time of the year. Um, these are from my um, fennel plant uh, in the yard, and you can use the, the uh, leaves on that. 
um, daylilies. They're a great source, right? Yes. Because yes, they of the are. pistols and stamen, and yeah. which we all hate when they fall on the kitchen counter, but they're great for dyeing fabric. Yes. And actually, you can eat daylilies. Oh, can you? You can. They okay. Are very edible. Yes, mm -hmm. they are very edible. All right, that'll uh, be another program. This is <laughs> <laughs> this is a status. Uh, a purple that uh, I, I'm not quite sure how that's going to turn out for dyeing. Uh, it was just in the um, bouquet. Um, dogwood leaves um, from dogwood trees, they're a good source. Um, mums, um, we didn't have any dahlias, but dahlias is another great source of uh, eco printing. Uh, these are, I, we're not quite sure if this is um, uh, chamomile or fever view. I'm thinking fever. And then we have uh, some roses. Red roses petals are fantastic in <coughs> eco dyeing. These are uh, more um, goldenrod, uh, and you can see the difference where these are not open and these are in full bloom. So we're going to see what kind of uh, marks it leaves. And one of the things you told me earlier is it, de it the color depends on when you harvest the plant. Yes. So it, you, a full flower plant is going to give you a different color than a plant that's still budded. Correct. Same as one that might be on the way down or like these that yes. aren't open yet. So. Correct. And even um, like sp uh, stinging nettle, uh, if you get sting stinging nettle in the springtime as it's uh, coming up with new growth, uh, that's a completely different color from in the, um, in the summer and in the fall. And in the fall, you can collect the flowers uh, from the stinging nettle and that, again, like I said, creates a different color. Aside from the colors that you're trying to achieve, we talked earlier about the fact that um, Many of the early colors faded fast. People didn't really have an idea of how to keep them lasting. So they were mostly bronze and reds, maybe orange. But you now use a product called a mordant. Yes. And a mordant is like a fixative. Correct. Would that be a way to describe yes. it? And what do you use as a mordant? Is um, there a material or? Well, there's, uh, there's um, soda ash, which is also um, borax soap detergent. Okay. Um, you can uh, alum and uh, cream of tartar. Okay, and we might as well bring it up because back in the olden days, they also used urine yes. to fix fabric color. And they find that if, if they use that, it would make the color of the fabric stay longer in the material. Right. So that basically sets the dye correct. into the material. Yeah. But again, that's another thing about the timing, correct? Yes, and um, the timing is, is of an essence. And uh, again, um, you can't let the material set too long in the dye and uh, the mordant because uh, they could, depending on what fiber you use, um, make it a, a weaker fiber. Oh, and, okay. Yeah. So you and don't want to hurt the material. Correct. Okay. Um, that's not something that you really leave overnight in the water. Um, but whenever you're dyeing, you can leave your uh, fiber in whatever um, you're dyeing it with. Like, um, you, you can get a stronger color when you leave it overnight. And that uh, makes sense. Yes. And um, So uh, some of the things that aren't shown here, I know that Barb was talking to me about walnuts. She brought walnuts. Water, right, yeah, yeah. Walnut water. Mm -hmm. we, we actually are going to use that as a modifier. Okay. Um, and we have the uh, walnut water outside along with um, iron, right? Is it iron? I made iron yeah. water, yes, which is basically just putting something, well, an iron related rusty soaking in the water. Um, like old nails yeah. or something. Yeah, <laughs> like nails, well, nails, you know, when you live on a farm, I live on a farm, you know, you, you, any, you can find anything rusty. Sure, and all sure. And you do is kind of soak it and then strain the, the rust out of the, out of the water and you have iron water and it's, yeah. And sometimes the, the different mordants will give you a different color. See, so this if you would use maybe a different mordant, yeah. and we also have copper yeah, it, right, soaking right. out there. So there is also, which is the same process, cool. just a little bit of copper pipe soaking in the water. And, and that and, could give you a different color. And I have um, yarn out there in the water, um, just soaking up some, uh, keeping it um, moist. Uh, I dyed that with the goldenrod and it created a nice um, yellowish green, but I'm going to also dip it into the indigo pot and that's supposed to produce a better green. Okay. So uh, we'll see what happens. Well, and that's an interesting thing since you said green, we'll talk about that real quick. Bes despite all this green that you see, there is no natural green dye. No. None of these create green. So in order to make that, we do what Deb talked about. You, you, you know your primary colors, you know you use blue and 
yellow to make green, and that's what they're going to do. Correct. So, yeah. so they were a very uh, creative group of people here we figuring out how to do it. And I, I found this book to be the best book as far as trying to create colors that you want. Um, and in it, it describes the plants um, to use and um, the, the mordants and the modifiers that you can use. And do I have the, do I have it marked? Yes, here it is. It's um, 25 colors from just one dye bath. So who could imagine that you could change the colors based on timing, Correct. length of putting it in, the mordant you use. And the modifiers the if you use a modifier, perfect. right. And uh, so it's, it's fantastic. God gave us a lot of beautiful things. So and we should use them. Yes, we, we should. Use them. Yes, we should. So as I said, this was not a spur of the moment. Obviously, Deb had to gather all this. A lot of women, of the women have been gathering things and have been soaking items to get them ready to use for dye. But there's other things you do and need to make this process happen. So let's take a minute here and then we'll take a walk outside okay. and we'll actually get into the actual demonstration. Okay, give us another minute. We'll be right back. Okay, back again. Before we step outside to the actual pots of dye, Deb's going to talk a little bit about some of the tools and other equi small equipment that they use. Now, one of the things that is interesting is um, they do different types of dyeing. You don't just drop it in the water. So they do tie dyeing and yeah. uh, your and shibori, ego, shibori, shibori. Yes, shibori. So explain uh, a little bit about that and some of the tools that you use. Um, well, the shibori um, is a, uh, a resist resistant type of dye. Um, you can see here, I took a silk scarf, and the silk scarf is this long. So I twisted it and um, secured, secured one end on, and I wrapped it around the pool again and I put another rubber band on and then just um, pulled it together to get that tightness to it so there's going to be a lot of resistance inside of this. And if you accordion pleated it, that would give another feature, like if you tried Correct. to put, make it pleats. So the idea is to take something and figure out where you don't want the dye to be, which is the resistance. Yes. Part. And uh, this, I just, uh, again, this is a, um, a woolen silk. And you can see the dis difference, how nice the silk is and, and the, the wool beautiful. is um, a little, almost like an opaque color. Sure. And uh, about, I'm doing this one in the silk and wool, and this is just the silk. Okay. So what are these little presses that you have, these little blocks? This is another way to resist the dyes, as uh, you can wrap the um, scarf around the square and then put more um, squares in it, or you can, like the lady did before, she made a, um, folded it and then put it between two um, blocks of wood. And then you use the clamps to make it tight. Yes. So that it's they have that compressed. resist. Yes, we got squares, little squares, we have hearts. Um, circles and you can see oh, these. Oh, so then that could give a design on Correct. Got it. So these, these can make a design onto the material based on how you tie it against each Correct. other. And we, um, in our uh, a previous one we did, somebody brought the uh, old, uh, what is this, Tinker? Tinker Toys. Tinker Toys. And these <laughs> make sorry, great what those marks <laughs> on, on, the, uh, on the fabric. So we have those. And then um, shut off valves. I've, I, <laughs> The pl a plumber is missing yeah, these yeah. somewhere. And uh, I stack these on top of a wooden block. It worked perfect um, once. And, the, uh, the interesting thing is I'm sure you don't know exactly what you'll get. 
Correct. You never and that's know. The, that's the fun part. You, you can't, get a surprise. You can't think that you uh, can do one thing and repeat it and get the same results. It won't happen. We were just talking about that, that if you decide you're going to dye fabric for a, a garment or something, you better dye enough yes. material, fiber and yarn. Yes to get done because well, you can never guarantee you'll get the same color. And um, this is uh, a proof that you can't get the same color. Um, I put this one in the dye pot first and I put this one in afterwards and you can see the first one absorb more than the second one. Okay, cool. And, uh, and this is tansy. I'll have and then to we have the, tansy. And then we have the normal gum bands that everybody usually uses for tie dyeing. Yes. Tie dyeing, I read, actually had a sort of a uh, start in the roaring 20s when they were trying to find cheap ways to make decorative things. And it then obviously had a resurgence in the 60s with the hippies and the peace, love, and uh, yeah. uh, hippie phase. So, <laughs> but yes, yeah, so we have gum bands, we have string, we have all kind of different things. Yeah, and but if you use something like clips. this, it's absorbent too, so it may not. Depending on what kind of clips you wanna use and um, hold it together real tight or, or loose. If you ever got stopped, people would wonder what you do for a living with all this different material. So yeah, yes, they would. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's also, excuse me, there's also another type of, of shibori dyeing where you can just use a needle and thread. Yes. And you can yeah. just stitch your your fabric and, and pull it. You know together. what? I have. Oh, really okay. Tight. I have sort of like when you gather. Fabric, uh, yes. So when you would gather something to make like a shirt effect yes. on a garment, yes. that's what you also yes. do with the fabric. Yeah. You can do that. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, I try to do um, a, um, a ribbon for cancer survivors oh, okay. and um, it, it worked on half of it, but you can see as a, it didn't. The tag of the other line. Okay. Yes. Um, so this goes to show you have to experiment a little right, bit. Right, right. But, uh, you know, you, you can do a lot. There you go. So these are some of the materials you use for that. Yes. So we'll go outside and you can show us some of the rest of the stuff you need to really make this process work. Okay. okay? So again, a few minutes and we'll meet you outside. Right. Hello again, everyone. We've moved outdoors, which is the perfect, this is a perfect day for dyeing fabrics outdoors. Uh, we're back with the ladies from the Washington Spinners and Weavers Guild, and now we're going to actually show you the process. So sitting out here, you'll see behind me several pots. These have been started earlier today, heated up, getting the materials into the water to get them percolating so that they release their color. Uh, right now, uh, Deb's working with an indigo color. They're going to try to put some fabric into that. Your... We have several other colors here based on what we told you earlier. She showed you a lot of flowers, a lot of different plants, things that are the sources of the color. So this is gonna be some actual process. Now, some of the material has to be wet before it goes in, some of it not wet, some may have been, and, and the material itself makes a difference. Wool changes colors differently than cotton changes colors. They have alpaca, they have things, any type of fiber, and it will react differently with the color. So in this particular case, we just drop some things into indigo. You can see how deep blue that is. Now, where did you get the indigo? Um, I purchased um, the dye kit on um, Dharma Trading. It's and, online. And it's an eco? Yes. So I just heard a story this morning about a woman who is farming indigo in South Carolina. Yes. And she's actually farming on land. She's an a African-American woman who's farming on land that her parents used to be, her mother and grandmother used to be slave workers on. Wow. So okay. in, she'll be a source of indigo for us here in yes, the United yes. States. Uh, there is false indigo plants that you could use, but it doesn't produce like this does. That looks a, like it'll be a beautiful blue, blue color. Yeah. So cool. So, so let's... When it comes out, it's yellow green. Yeah. Is it really? It's yes. The air yeah, the air. Well, it's it's oh, see, now that's something else you, that I would have never thought. Mm -hmm. So it's the air that makes the color then adhere and change. Barb, what are you doing with yours? I'm going to put it in my walnut. Okay. Okay. Alrighty. So you want to do that next? I can. Okay. okay. Come on we'll over. The, the, so we're going to see some in there. Go ahead. The one already in? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So that's what walnut looks like. Walnut, yes, yeah. So walnut stain. So if you're using walnut, be very careful because it just it doesn't need a mordant, doesn't need to fix it. And it we'll will just give you the, the color. Yeah. That looks like bean soup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't look no, like No, not like bean that. soup. Okay, like what color do we have next here? This is um, onion skins. So all those onion skins were thrown away, we could be using to color something. Yes, ma'am. Only yellow onion. Only yellow onion, not green onion. Um, or not red onion. No, no. A red onion won't give you any color? And you can see the bag was white, so you can understand um, the color change. And you'll notice that obviously Deb's wearing gloves. Everyone who's, who's working with this material is wearing gloves. First of all, the I water is very hot. And second too. of all, it's very, um, some of the materials are caustic. And this is uh, avocado um, skins. And they're, what color are they going to create? I'm not quite sure. Is it brown? A brownish, or they, they won't be green though? No. 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 Okay. It's, it is a brownish color. Oh, that's just water. And this is another, um, uh, what is in here? Oh, these are the um, nuts to the avocados. You can see it, it has a nice red. I think it turns out like a reddish brown. So and how long will you, have you had things soaking? Um, we've had everything cooking about one o'clock, um, 10 o'clock. Since 10 o'clock? Yeah. Do you, okay. you want to get it out? No, she no, was just stirring it because she I want like... my fibers to stick together. So okay. So is this a process where sometimes you have to stand there and work with the material? So well, no, you don't want, really. because you don't want a whole lot of air in there because it will the deplete the, the dyeing. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So air. on one hand, the air affects it after you bring it out, but yes. if it's in the water, it could change the way the color is. Yes. Correct. Yes. See, these are all the things that people in the early days had to learn by trial and error. <laughs> yes, they did. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Cool. Yeah. And she was just mixing the fiber so that it, it, they don't it, it was together. sticking together and, and be more of a resist. She wanted to move the fibers I didn't even think around. about that. That's a good idea. So when she takes that out, then is that the point in which you put in that mordant or that... Um, no, no, you don't do anything to these. Okay. What you no. do is, is rinse it out. She already did. She, yeah, yeah she, I did. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the cotton, what I did is I soaked it in, uh, actually I boiled it in Dawn dish detergent and soda ash. Okay. And I boiled for maybe 20 minutes. Once the fiber floats to the bottom of the can, it's good to it's go. It's good to go. Mm -hmm. I didn't know you, you do Dawn. Well, how come you put Dawn in? Um, just to, because, scour. yeah, the scour. It. Okay. It, right. Cotton has a film. Yes. Yeah. So you want to get that out so the dye takes. So That's it, good you so do it, two at one time. Just one time, yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. Cool. I didn't know that. So is there any of these that you have to do a more than after you take it out of the dye? Um, only if you want to modify the color again. Okay. Um, say if we... Um, Turn around. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, if we uh, do... A lighter color, uh, the onion skins. If we would do the onion skins uh, and then we'll put it in the walnut, it will change the color completely. Okay. So You also mentioned that if you want a deeper color, sometimes you bring it out, you let it dry. Especially with the indigo. Right, and then you drop it back in again. Yeah, so you wring it, it out, rinse it out, and then um, let it sit for a few minutes and then put it back in. Oh, okay, so you don't have to let it dry. You no, can just put no. it back in. Correct. Cool. So the end result of all this is that you're going to dye fabric fibers that you're then going to make into a garment. Correct. Whether it's a scarf, a sweater. As I told you, these ladies do all kind of crafts, knitting, crocheting, weaving. And uh, so then you actually take them, the fiber or the fabric that you may have already spun or purchased, and then you do something more with it. Correct. Cool. Correct. Yeah. Cool. How often do you actually do the dyeing process? Um, maybe once or twice a year. Okay. Um, so, depending on how the, the blooming of the flowers, the plants. Okay. So uh, fall is a good time? Yes. Cool. Um, Midsummer is probably the best time because you have more flowers blooming. 
And um, daffodils is a, are another flower that you can use. So that's early spring. Sure, sure. And uh, you probably could use violets. Yes, violets definitely. Yeah. But but violet is not a color. Purple is not a color that you can get very well out of nature. Correct. One of the things I did read when I was doing some research is that purple, as you know, was attributed to royalty, and it actually came from something called a murex snail. And it took a very painstaking process to get that color, and it became very valuable. So that's why the king decided that it shouldn't be anyone's but his. So, but purple, you can, how do you, you would do what? You would have to get blue, you would have to get green, excuse me, you could do blue and red would be purple if you could get a red. Yeah. That, that would, would be, be hard. Yeah. 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 Not not an easy thing to red do. Red is usually your cochineal bud. Yeah. Oh, the, yeah, right. Yeah. We didn't talk about insects. Insects are another great source of of uh, dye. Unfortunately, and not the uh, spotted lanternfly. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a good thing if we could find a use for those buggers. But uh, no, but insects were another source. And, and um, we talked too about lichen and about the fact that moss can also be another yes, source yes so almost any kind of plant but again none of them are actually going to give you a green you have to still back yourself into different colors right and lichen is another one that you could use um, urine with but uh, we always opt to use ammonia okay well ammonia urine same thing <laughs> yes so cool cool yeah. Yeah. So how long will you have to work with this material before these dyes before you're ready to pull out your things and take them away about 20 minutes half hour yeah okay Okay, yeah. so what's your plan for the blue? What are you making out of that? A scarf. A scarf? Mm -hmm. Are you knitting, crocheting, or? Weave. Weaving, okay. Mm -hmm. We hope to come back at another show and convince some of you to teach us the weaving, teach us the spinning, maybe get some knitting and crocheting. And see our projects. And see the there. projects yes, that, yes, <laughs> that came out of these dye bags. Most definite, yes. So, so, you know, this is not something, as I said, that's a spur of the moment. We think that um, these ladies are dedicated to preserving these skills, yes. to keeping the old traditions alive. Yes. And it's been great to share this time with you and Thank for you. letting you show and explain to everybody out there how color in the early days came about. So I think we're about wrapped up here. We're gonna have to do some cleanup. Yes, so. <laughs> and continue dying. And continue dying. Yes. So we're gonna take a break again and then I'll see you in a few. I hope you've enjoyed everything you've seen today. I need to thank the women, the lovely women of the Washington Spinners and Weavers Guild for letting us join them for this demonstration of fiber and fabric color dyeing. Please know that the women here do a variety of fiber and fabric art crafts. If you happen to be a closet weaver or closet knitter or somebody who might think about learning how to spin or weave, look them up. They meet the first, excuse me, the third Friday of every month, Center Presbyterian Church at 10 o'clock. They're open to new members. Even if you don't have a craft yet, but would like to find out more, these ladies are a wealth of information. So please consider dropping by third Friday of every month, 10 o'clock at Center Presbyterian. I just wanted to say thanks again for everyone who participated. Hopefully you will take what you've seen and have a good appreciation of how color came to be in the early days. Thank you so much for joining in. I'm Monica Merrill. See you next time. <laughs>